And without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Corey Saunders, child psychologist, and his long title is the Director of Access and Coordination of Family Mental Health and Addictions, Windsor Regional Hospital. Well, thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Can everybody hear me okay? Just wanna make sure. If anybody can't hear me for some reason, shout out, let me know. Tonight, I wanted to do an overview as a presentation. Part is kind of just as the kickoff for this whole process that we wanted to go through and to make sure that everybody in the community had a good feel for you know, what this was all about and what we were trying to accomplish by having this series of talks. When I started to sit down and think about it, what did I really want to say? And it's great for me to get up in front of people sometimes and, and go all technical and talk about you know this thing and this research and this kind of stuff. It's kind of academic, it's kind of dry. People go to sleep on me. You know, It's not the greatest thing in the world, but I thought, what, what do people really care about? And so at the end of it, I thought, what people really care about is the kids, and not just the kids, but really the kids in our community. So I thought maybe something that nobody's really done a whole lot of in the past is let's talk about children's mental health, but let's talk about it in the context of Windsor-Essex. What do we know about children's mental health in Windsor-Essex? And you know, we know lots about children's mental health, but if I asked a lot of people, what about the kids in your own community? A lot of people are surprised when I start to tell them some of the things that we know based on the work that we do with the kids. So in terms of the agenda for tonight, just some of the things that I'd like to talk about with everyone is to first look at the Windsor-Essex treatment landscape, meaning what is available for kids and youth in our communities in terms of treatment. I also want to give you a brief overview of the types of programs that we have uh, at the Windsor Regional Hospital associated with the Regional Children's Centre, and a little bit of information about some of the statistics to let you know about the types of kids that we see what the problems are like, how many we see, things like that. I want to give you a basic overview of, this is where I can get a little bit academic, some of the difficulties that kids are experiencing and what those are and what they sort of look like. And then, you know, talk a little bit about what the series is going to be like. So first of all, if we take a look at Windsor-Essex and what's available in Windsor-Essex from a children's mental health standpoint, we have a few different options. We have Children's First, which is an organization that services children aged 0 to 6. Uh, we have Maryvale, which is an organization that services 13 to 18. We have New Beginnings, which is a program that services a lot of kids who are in the youth justice system. We have the Inn of Windsor, which uh, services you know teen girls. And we have Windsor Regional Hospital, who we technically have services for 0 to 18, but our primary service area is 6 to 18. When you look at the programs that we offer, you can see by the number that are up on the slide, there are a lot of them. Uh, we try to do a little bit of everything. And I don't want to make it seem like we have a huge, gigantic program with tons and tons of people working. But we try to do what we can do. Um, we've only got a little over 100 staff, if that will give you any indication. But within that, we have things like coordinated access, so we have a way to hook people up with the services that they need through helpline, through our intake department, through service coordination. We have our children's crisis services, which involve the walk-in clinic and the emergency room response program, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We have our children's treatment services, where we have specific treatment clinics for kids. We have our youth justice services, which involve probation, diversion, uh, adolescent sex offender groups, youth mental health court worker who actually works in the courts. Uh, as a pre-charge diversion type of program. We have our intensive family services, which we refer to as our continuum, uh, which offers everything from residential services through milieu, through day treatment, and reintegration back into the school system. We also have a series of assessment and consultation services, which could include things like developmental services, psychological services, psychiatric services, and medical services. We have the child and adolescent mental health beds, which are currently housed at Maryvale, where the kids go when they have need of immediate assistance. And of course, we have the sexual assault, domestic violence treatment, and safe kids programs for kids who have had some sort of uh, abuse performed. In terms of staffing, as you can see, 
overall right now about 113.54. That half person, I keep trying to find him. I have no idea where he hides out all day long. But in essence, we have social workers, child and youth workers, psychologists, psychometrists, and we have our medical consultants. These are the numbers that I think people start to get surprised at. When we look at the number of kids that we serviced in 2011, 2012, it was 2,725. It's an awful lot of kids. The number of visits to our center in 2011, 12 was over 10,000. That's a lot of visits. We have a lot of kids in need. When we think about childhood diseases, I like this slide, because it has a nice little series of numbers up there on it. We have some really rare disorders up there, muscular dystrophy. You see about one in 6,000 kids with that. Cystic fibrosis, one in 4,000. Childhood cancer is about one in 500. Diabetes, three in 100. Autism, two to three in 500. Or if you go by the new US numbers, it's one in 88 or one in 50 boys. Everybody has heard tell of the autism epidemic, I'm sure, because they talk about how autism is a rising problem and is becoming more and more prevalent. One in 88. Does anybody have any idea what the children's mental health statistics are and where it compares? One in five. This is a true epidemic in and of itself. We don't even know it exists in a lot of cases. If you think about it, you're all sitting at tables of five, and I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but... <laughs> Chances are, we could say that there's a one in this room, you could look at every table and say there's at least one person at each of these tables that has a mental health issue. And in a lot of cases, we don't know it. Because often when we talk about kids that have mental health issues, people have this idea in their head about what that means and what those kids look like. But in fact, you probably passed a bunch of people with mental health issues on your way here tonight. And you probably wouldn't know the difference because having a mental health issue doesn't make you like the crazy people that we see in movies. Because one in five people have probably experienced it at some point in their life. So that's a really important statistic. What does that mean? That means in any classroom you walk into a regular school system, you are likely to find five, perhaps, kids in that classroom with mental health issues. How many teachers, if you went into their classroom and said, how many mental health problem kids do you have in your classroom? They might say one. They might say two. They might not say any. You're not likely going to hear them say five, six, ten, right? Unless you're in a section 23 classroom for kids with mental health issues, and then they all have them, right? But the bottom line is, is that people often don't recognize the mental health issues in the kids that we have in the community. So that one in five is often hidden. We don't see them. And part of the reason why we have so much trouble in terms of getting appropriate treatment in place is because of the fact that we haven't even identified who these people are. I saw this really nice video. It's on YouTube if you want to look it up. It's called Generation Flux. I saw this a couple of weeks ago talks a lot about youth and employment and all that kind of stuff, but it had some really interesting mental health facts in it, which were Canadian. And I haven't seen a whole lot of Canadian facts, so I thought this was pretty interesting. Mental health is the second highest hospital care expenditure in Canada for youth. So when we think of why youth go to the hospital, mental health is the second most expensive. 3.2 million Canadian youth aged 12 to 19 are at risk of developing depression. When we think of the number of kids who exist in Canada, 3.2 million seems like a really big number. If you have children who are in low-income households, they are at further risk of developing mental health issues. And the biggie, which is the one that kills me every time I see it, 75% of children who do need treatment do not receive any. Those are those hidden kids. Those are the ones that are in the classrooms, that are in the community, that are walking around, and people just don't know that they have issues because kids keep stuff hidden. So it's important to take a look at it and see what can we do to help these kids out. 
Here's another graph that I thought was really impressive. I love showing this one because it talks a lot about our community. This is a graph from a few years back which looked at the referrals for children's mental health services across Ontario and compared Windsor-Essex to the rest of Ontario. The white lines are the rest of Ontario, the blue lines are Windsor-Essex. What we see with this graph is that right at about the time that we started to hear of problems within the auto industry, we started to see a little blip in terms of referrals and at the time that we started to see the big problems coming where we had layoffs and things like that, we saw more and more incidents. So at one point, there was a 50% increase in the number of referrals for children's mental health that was directly coinciding with the auto industry difficulties. And people say, that doesn't make sense. Why, why would that happen? You know, kids have nothing to do with the auto industry. Well, you know, their parents, when they're laid off, there's less money, the parents are stressed. One parent might have to go away to another city out of province to get work, so we have pseudo single parents who sit home with the kids. So many things that can happen in those situations can change the family dynamic and can change the way in which the child experiences their life. So when you think about it, that can have a huge impact. Kids are, you know, they don't live in a bubble. They are like little sponges. They soak up things in their environment. You can't tell me that if you're upset, your child doesn't know. They can't tell I'm upset. They can tell you're upset. So those little things, those little factors have an impact on children's lives. So when we see the stress go up in the adult lives, we see the stress go up in the children's lives. And that makes a difference. If you look at this graph, this just gives you an overall indication of annual referrals that we've had since 2006, so when that graph started, because it was only for about six months. And you can see that our numbers have steadily risen up until 2012-13. The red line is where we are currently. The yellow triangle is actually where I'm predicting that we're going to be by year end in terms of the statistics. When you look at that, you can see that really it's only been in the last couple of years that we've plateaued. So really, ever since those issues began to happen, our numbers have gone up and up and up, and they continue to go up. And we haven't seen them come back down yet. Even though we've seen some instances of economic recovery in this area. We certainly haven't seen it translate to our kids yet. <clears throat> in terms of when they come through our doors, what do they come through with? What we see is about 45% of them come through with what we call externalizing disorders, which means that they have everything out there. This is the kids who are behavioral, who are doing things because you see it all the time. That's what externalized means. 40%, 41%-ish, internalized. That's the ones that hold it inside. So those are the ones that are likely struggling with things like anxiety or depression, that kind of stuff. About 7% is ability-related, meaning that they have some sort of cognitive-related deficit that's affecting their mental health. And finally, 6% situational, meaning something's happened and it's led to them experiencing difficulty. These actually represent the problems identified when the parents come in through the doors. So that doesn't mean that's what they actually have. This is just what the parents are saying the issues are. One of the things that I see is that once we get into things and start digging, those underlying factors can change. So what we're saying, this child is coming in looking like they're externalized because they got lots of behavior issues. When we bring them in, we actually find out that they've got problems related to anxiety or depression. And that's really what we're seeing. That sort of brings me to this idea of psychopathology as a continuum. So psychopathology is the word that we use to describe mental health issues. It's the technical term. But when we think about it, is that many types of psychopathology or mental health issues exist upon a continuum. If you have somebody who's depressed, you sort of have a continuum of depression. You can have really happy people. And then you can have people who are okay, and then you can have people who are a little bit sad, and then a little bit more sad. There is a line where you cross where we eventually call that depression. But you can understand that if you have symptoms, you can be sad and not have a clinical depression. 
Lots of people have symptoms without having a disorder. There's a range of normal emotions that would, we would expect to see. In somebody, for example, something horrible happens, we expect them to be sad, we expect them to be upset, we expect them to react. That's situational. That's something has happened that's caused this. When you have something that is long-lasting, long-standing, doesn't go away, is not situationally related, and it impacts on your daily functioning, that's when we see what we call a disorder. Anxiety is the first one that I like to talk about. Anxiety is really important to me. I like that one. Um, if you want to boil it down to its most core component, it is persistent fear and discomfort. It's a fear of whatever. Something is making you uncomfortable. You need to escape. That's what anxiety is all about. We can call it technical names like generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, separation anxiety, phobias. There's lots of things we can call it, but realistically, it, it all boils down to the same thing. What I say is that anxiety is probably one of the most, if not the most, common form of psychopathology or mental health issue found in children. Anxiety has a huge number of symptoms that mimic other things. So often, we often mistake those other things as being something completely different. So for example, if you have a child who is overly anxious and they're always thinking in their head and worrying and trying to come up with, you know, what's going to happen if I do this and what's going to happen if I do that, they don't pay attention very well in school. So what do we call them? ADHD because they're not paying attention. Or what about if they're so anxious they're all over the place? Well, then they're hyperactive, right? Some kids get extremely anxious. They get overly frustrated, and then what do they do? They get really upset, and, and they throw things. What do we call them? Oppositional defiant disorder. It all seems to boil down to, in a lot of cases, that these children have some sort of problem that's causing them to need to get away from things. And it's that underlying anxiety that's often causing these other behaviors. The other part of anxiety that's something that's very important to remember is the fact that anxiety is very highly related to depression. So that if you have a child who has anxiety, chances are that that child is going to have an increased likelihood of having symptoms related to depression or full-blown depression at some point. So it's something we always have to watch out for. When you look at depression as, at its core, it's that overwhelming sadness, the complete lack of motivation. We can call it dysthymia, major depression, bipolar disorder in some cases. What does it come down to? These are individuals who have very poor self-concept. They often have negative self-images. They don't have a very good outlook on themselves, and they just think everything is bad. Again, what we see for a lot of kids who have depression is that that depression is often mimicking other problems. There's actually something that's been referred to lots of times in the research, and it's referred to as masked depression. And why do we call it masked depression? Because the fact that it's depression that's hidden behind a mask, and it's often hidden behind a mask of anger. So when we see little kids, little kids often, when they're depressed, they act out. They become aggressive, they become angry, they scream, they do all sorts of bad things. Not because they're bad kids or because of the fact that they can't control their behavior. It's in a lot of cases because they've got symptoms of depression and nobody has recognized it. Depression, of course, big thing that we always talk about with depression is that it is often a red flag for suicidal ideation. We always have to watch kids when they have depression this is something we watch out for. If you look at the suicide statistics, under the age of 15, it's one to two kids per 100,000. In the age group of 15 to 19, it's 11 per 100,000. Some fairly high numbers when we think about it. It's the fourth leading cause of death for children aged 10 to 14, and the third leading cause of death for teenagers 15 to 19. It's a major problem. The last one also, 2 to 6% of children 
will attempt suicide. Those are pretty big numbers. Because again, when you think of a classroom, classroom has 25 kids in it, chances are, you know, there's a possibility that one of them at some point will attempt. So it's a big problem. What do we do? Well, if kids, you see them having difficulties or whatever, there's, there's lots of different things we can address with it. If you've got kids who are under the age of 16, the first thing we do is we take them to the emergency room at, at campus. Um, if they're over 16, they go to Hotel Dew, Grace, because they're technically an adult. As part of the process that we're working on right now, because we're trying to make services more accessible to people, because I know anybody, for example, here from Leamington, if you show up at the Leamington ER uh, and you are suicidal, chances are that they either ship you to Met Hospital or they ship you to Chatham. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is work with our telemedicine network. Uh, right now, we're actually doing evaluations of kids in Chatham via video conferencing for those kids. Uh, and it's something that we're trying to explore so that would be an option for Leamington as well. So that if kids come here, it's easier for us to just see them, deal with the issues, and then move on. If it's not emergency, in terms of this is not an immediate self-harm threat or a threat to somebody else, then we always still have the walk-in clinic, which is an urgent care model. Meaning that if you have concerns and you need to talk to somebody immediately, then you bring them in and we go to the walk-in clinic. So that's Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday from 12 to 6. This graph, very interesting. It sort of looks at our walk-in clinic referrals and things that we've had in the last, again, from 2006 up to the current year. And again, the numbers at the end are where they are at the six-month mark and the triangle is where I'm anticipating they're going to be. One of the things you notice is a decline in our use of walk-in clinic. There are fewer kids coming through the walk-in clinic than there used to be. Part of it is a change in process, but the other part of it is walk-in clinic is for kids when they have a problem that needs more immediate attention that is not at the extreme level. So what we're seeing is that there's fewer kids who can come in and benefit from that type of service than what there were three or four years ago. What does that mean? Kids are more complex. They're coming in with more complex problems. It's harder for us to deal with them. This graph shows crisis response. These are the numbers of kids who show up in the emergency room because of suicidal ideation or extreme behavioral difficulties that we're concerned about, homicidal problems. As you can see, the numbers have gone up pretty consistently over the last few years. And again, I'm predicting uh, about the same for this year. There are a lot of kids in our area that really have a lot of problems. And we don't see them. If I go back for a second, the line on the bottom is the number that are admitted to a hospital bed because they're not safe to go home. I forgot to say that part. So you can see, again, fairly consistent number in the sense that a lot of these kids who come in are actually put into mental health beds because they're not safe to go home. This other graph here shows us the other reality of the way things are right now. So when we talk about the number of admissions that we see to those hospital beds, that would be our blue lines. The red lines on here are related to the number of kids that have to go into a bed in the pediatrics unit because there is no space available for them. And when we look at this, what we see is that for 2012-13, that's only at the six month mark. And that, as you can notice, we've already had more people in beds this year than we've had last year in total that have had to wait. A lot of our kids now, the beds at Maryvale, the acute psychiatric beds are full. We're at about 110 to 120% capacity almost every month. Meaning that those beds are constantly full and as soon as one person goes out, somebody gets shifted in. And we've got kids who are waiting, I've seen some waiting as long as a week in pediatrics to get into those beds because the beds are not available. Again, you would think in terms of our community that it's not that big of a problem, but realistically when you think about it, if we can fill those beds up constantly, 
and there not be enough room there that we even have overflow, really we've got a lot of kids with significant issues. Those problems are becoming more complex, like I said, more difficult to treat, we're seeing more and more of it. What does this lead to? Often it leads to self-medication. Self-medication is basically using drugs and alcohol to alleviate symptoms. So if I feel depressed, for example, the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to smoke marijuana or I'm going to do something else that's going to make me feel better or I'll drink because it will take away the pain that I'm experiencing. What do we know about that? Well, when you look at it, the use of alcohol or, or some other illicit substance is going to often compound the problem for a couple of different reasons. One of which, you take something like marijuana, which seems to be a fairly innocuous drug that they always talk about, well, we'll just legalize it or whatever. That's great and all. I mean, cigarettes are legal and they're deadly. But what we know about marijuana is that in a subset of individuals, especially those with mental health problems, it increases the likelihood of anxiety. So you think you're going to smoke it and chill out, chances are you're going to make yourself worse. It increases the likelihood that you're going to have an onset of psychosis or schizophrenia. It is going to increase the likelihood that you are going to attempt or commit suicide. It's a big problem. The second part is, of course, this increases the likelihood of substance abuse. It's not just simple enough to say, okay, yeah, great, well, I can go have a drink and it'll make me feel better, but often what happens is that that is used to excess and it becomes a secondary problem. So we actually have a whole series of uh, services within mental health that are often referred to as concurrent disorders programs, which basically are programs for people with mental health issues who have a substance abuse problem on top of that. That's how prevalent this is. And we often say, well, that's in adults. Well, you know, when we look at the average age of people who are showing up in detox, it's not that old. They're much younger than I am. So realistically, what does that say? Again, we've got a big problem. Do we have services here for kids in Windsor-Essex in terms of substance abuse? No. If you have a child that is requiring a residential treatment facility for substance abuse, we are shipping them elsewhere in the province. And it's not even close like London. We're shipping them up north at a very big expense, number one. Number two, removing them from their community. It's something that needs to change. This is something that I wish we actually had programs here for locally. So, in terms of this whole process, when we were thinking about it and trying to figure out what do people need to know about, well, I've kind of touched on it. So we thought, let's start to address some of these issues in detail. So for example, in February, there's going to be some discussion of anxiety in a little bit more detail. Uh, then in March, we're going to talk about depression. Uh, April, suicide. May, crisis response. And June, self-medication. Those tend to be the big areas that people want to know about. So, that brings me to the end, and I'm going to open the floor for questions, if anybody has any. And as happened in Windsor, everybody is dead silent, because it's so depressing. <laughs> the workshop in February is uh, going to be at the Kaboto in Windsor and... Yes. So the 13th in the Kaboto Club, the 27th Migration Hall. I think all of the seminars are going to be held at the Kaboto in Windsor, and I think they're moving around the county for the remainder. And we're trying to do them in both places so that everybody can have an opportunity to come out and learn a little bit and find out about what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be one in five, and of those one in five, only 75% of the one. So 0.75, or no, 0.25 receive treatment, if you want to think of it in, in kind of that way.
Yeah. Yeah, it's a general statistic. It's kind of, if it's not one that's based in a hardcore number of the kids who are coming and receiving treatment because part of the issue is, is that we're only seeing 25% of them. Now, the scary thing about that is, as you saw from the slides that I indicated, is when you look at, for example, the number of kids and the new referrals we have every year, we get almost 1,700 new referrals every year. And if you think if 1,700 is only one quarter of the kids who have the issues. How many kids do we have out there? I don't know what the census population is for kids in terms of Windsor Essex, but you know, if I'm thinking there's maybe, you know, 300, 350,000 people in Windsor Essex, children are going to account for maybe a third of them. So maybe there's 100,000. But if I'm getting, you know, almost 2,000 a year and we multiply that by four, it's almost 10,000 a year, really, it's a large proportion. Yep. Um, what do you see the role of uh, educators in the school system being, and um, what would you suggest educators or teachers or all the support staff, um, I mean, how do we get the message out there that there are services available? How do you broach that topic? <sighs> We're trying very hard to make sure that we get the message out to as many people as possible that there are services available. And we're doing that in a variety of different ways. And this would be just one of those ways, for example. Uh, but I mean, we're also trying to be very communicative with the medical community, with the schools in general, to say these are the types of services that are offered. And please, you know, use them. Uh, we certainly had the Student Support Leadership Initiative, uh, which did the We Are Kids Mental Health website, uh, which is an area where you can go on and basically find out about all the services that exist within our community. So if you do have a question, it's just go point and click and you can find out who does what. So there are a lot of ways that we've tried to do that. On a more kind of individual basis, I think it's a matter of, you know, if you see something, to bring it up sooner rather than later provide the information. And I'm not suggesting that teachers or anybody else for that member should, should go around and say, hey, you know, I think your child is depressed. Go get them Prozac. Uh, we're not talking about like that, but if you see issues, you should be trying to communicate that. To say, you know what, I've noticed this, I've noticed that. Be factual. So this is what I've seen. I've got some concerns about that because I've seen other kids who are like that and this is the type of stuff that's happened. So we want to make sure we catch it as early as possible. And I think having that kind of discussion is probably really important um, because realistically, I mean, you want them to make sure they get the services that are available when they need them, not you know two years later, right? Uh, and one of the things that we know is that services are not immediately available.